Welcome to this video tutorial on how to create complex terrain models from contour lines using Rhino and Grasshopper. To begin, I first need to acquire contour line data, which I'm going to be using to make my terrain models. To do this, I'm going to use Digimaps, which is a UK source of data for downloading mapping data and other sources of data that we can use in our Rhino files. If you're not based in the UK, you can find kind of government websites that have contour lines and topographic data that you can also use. And this tutorial can be used for that. So you can skip ahead to when we start working with that data if you're not located in the UK. If you are and you can use Digimaps as part of your university system, we're going to just go to their ordnance survey section go on OS Digimaps. I'm going to find an area with the data I want to download. Now I want a really topographic area for this. So I'm just going to the Lake District. We're going to find a kind of very mountainous area. I'm going to go on download data, draw out a rectangle where my data is going to be kept. We're going to go to land and height data. Make sure we select this OS terrain five contours. Five represents that they're five meter spacing on that contour line. Once we tick that, we're going to go add to bar skip and we're going to select the format as a DWG file. It's important we use DWGs because this is just a drawing file that we can then import into our Rhino model. Once we select that, we're going to hit request download. That will be emailed to us and we can then download that file. So once you've got that, we're then going to open up Rhino and import that file directly in. Now, once I've opened Rhino, I'm going to import the file just by going file, import. We're going to locate where that folder is. Now mine's located here. So I'm just going to copy that in my line. And then we're going to select that DWG that's come through from my Digimaps import and hit open like so. We're just going to hit OK there. And what you'll often find is it will load in, but you might not be able to see it in your file. And I think if those of you who are following along with this tutorial have got your data from other sources, this is usually the way that you'll load that data in to your Rhino file, but you won't be able to see it. It will be really far away because the way the data is kind of formatted is it will usually be formatted to real world coordinates. So Rhino also works on coordinates. We're at point zero zero here. And unless you're downloading a bit of data from the world that's at coordinate zero zero, it won't appear here. It will be hundreds and hundreds of meters away um, in that Rhino file. So in order to find it, we just want to click zoom extents and that will load in where that data is kept. Now, usually it depends if you're kind of going to be loading in multiple bits of data, you want to keep it in this place so things line up. A lot of time, like Rhino doesn't really like it when you're located really far from the center. So often what I might do, if I know it's just this thing I'm going to be working with, I'll just take it and I'll move it to coordinate zero, zero, just by hitting the move tool and typing zero, comma, zero, comma, zero, like so, to move it to that point. Then we'll hit zoom extents again, and we've now got this back at the center. The reason for this is when I do things like make to Ds, they always appear at the center of the file as well. So it's sometimes just easier to center your geometry just to make it a little bit easier to work with. Now, before we start working with this and turning this into a 3D model, I'm first just going to turn off a few layers. When we got it in, we also get these kind of number layers and spot heights and point heights that come in as well. I don't need these for this particular tutorial, so I'm just going to turn off those labels and turn off those spot heights just so we've got the contour lines that we needed, like so. Now we're here, we're now going to take all these contour lines and we're going to try and turn these into a polysurface, an editable piece of 3D Rhino geometry that we can then sculpt into, design into and work with from there. To do that, we're going to be using Grasshopper to first take these lines, extract all those points that make up the lines, and then use those points to create a mesh that we can then use to then create a surface. So it's a sort of four step process in order to get to our achieved goal of creating this poly surface. Now, if you haven't used Grasshopper before, don't worry, this is a really easy process for this particular tutorial and you don't need any previous knowledge of Grasshopper to be able to do this. We're going to start just by typing in Grasshopper into the command line, like so, and then this will open up this window here. Now I've got the command I used previously, but I'm going to just delete that so we can make it from scratch. If you want to get a brand new Grasshopper file, you can go File, A New there, and that will just clean that slate so you've then got a blank file to work with. 
For those of you unfamiliar with Grasshopper, the way this works is we're going to be using a node-based system in order to affect our model in Rhino here. And I'm going to make some other videos on introductions to Grasshopper as well that you can always use to follow along if you want to learn a bit more about that process. For this particular tutorial, all we need to do is tell Grasshopper that we're going to be using these curves here in order to make the model. And to do that, we're going to use the curve parameter that's found under the parameters option under curve here and we're just going to place it on our board. Now you can either find your nodes by clicking in this menu or you can double click in the kind of slate here and then you can type in the name of your node curve in this instance to find it there as well. Now in order to kind of link this node to these curves we just have to select our curves there, right click on our node and go set multiple curves and that will link the two together. You know they're linked because if you click on the curve it will go green in the Rhino file so we know they're connected. The next thing we want to do is extract all the control points out from these curves which we can then use to triangulate our mesh. To do that I'm going to double click and we're going to type in control points like so. We're going to find that control point node there and then we're just going to link the curve to that control point like so and if I zoom in you can see now it's extracted all those little points out from those curves like so. Now we're going to use these points now to then make our mesh but in order to do that we need to kind of turn them into coordinates. You'll see in Grasshopper whenever you use a node you have an input i.e. the geometry that's going in and then the outputs from it here. We're going to be using this P for points output that we're getting from here but if I hover over that with my mouse you'll see they're just defined like this at the moment we actually want those as a string of coordinates instead which will then help us make the mesh so to do that we need to right click on that P and click on this flatten option that will put a little arrow next to it so we know it's flattened and then if we hover over it again you'll see now they're listed out as a series of coordinates and that way I know I can now use them to make my mesh once we've got that, we're then going to go to the mesh setting and we're going to use this little green mesh node here, the Delaunay mesh um, or the Dell mesh. And you can see there, open that up there and we're going to connect the points option from the output of this node to the points input of this node. And we're just going to connect them together. Now this may take a little bit of time depending on the speed of your computer and the density of that mesh but what it will do is it's going to triangulate all these points together to make a mesh and once it's done you can kind of see if I select it there we've got this green mesh that sits under these points. It's quite hard to see so you might want to kind of disable the preview just by right clicking on this CP node to hide those points and there you can see my mesh is there. And this is actually all we need Grasshopper for for this tutorial. So once you've done this we're then going to select our kind of mesh node output here we're going to right click and go bake and this will kind of bake the geometry and bring it in to our Rhino model so we can then work with it in Rhino. So we're going to hit bake there, hit OK. It will tell us that it's probably an invalid object, don't worry too much about that, doesn't matter for this and we'll just go OK like so. Then I can just minimize the grasshopper. If you want you can always save that script and you can use it again later for other terrains that you're bringing in but for this I'm just going to kind of close it down because I don't need it anymore and then I'm going to select my mesh and I'm just going to move it over here so we can see it a little bit more clearly. Now once you've made it you'll see that this mesh is really dense it's made up of lots and lots of polygons and triangles so the first thing I want to do is just reduce this down so it's a little bit easier to work with. To do that we're going to use the reduce mesh command I'm just going to make a copy of it first so we can see it as a comparison so we can kind of see what the command does and once we've got that I'm going to select this one and we'll just type in reduce mesh like so. Um, either you can reduce it by a specific amount or by a percentage. I found with this particular mesh I can actually reduce it by around 60% and it doesn't really affect the quality. In essence you want to reduce it by as much as possible because the more you can reduce it by the smaller that file size will be and the quicker you can then work with that model as well. So I'd aim to reduce it by as much as you can. If it looks really weird when you've reduced it then you can always go back and then redo the process with a slightly lower number to get that kind of optimum reduction but there isn't really a kind of rule of thumb for what's best. It kind of really depends on the kind of geometry you're doing and the result you want to get. But once you've got it you see then I've reduced that mesh and if we look at it in rendered mode it's actually very difficult to see the difference. They kind of look the same and there we've got a really high level of detail in both models 
And even in the reduced one, you can't see any reduction that we're getting from the first mesh. If I actually kind of go back to shaded, but we look at this in the top view and just minimize these views down so we can see them a bit bigger. You can slightly see this a bit more, that you can see the density of the mesh on the left is much denser than the one on the right. So basically what it's done is it's just kind of reduced those numbers of triangles there and given us slightly less to work with here, which is making a slightly simpler model. Now, once we've reduced this, we're then going to turn this mesh into a poly surface. And we're going to do this using the drape tool by draping a surface over the top of our mesh that's going to conform to that shape and give us a nice poly surface. Now, to find the drape tool, it can be found under the surface options, under drape here, or you can just type in drape. I'm just going to select my surface, type in drape, and then we're just going to drag a window over the top. Now, before I do this, I just want to make note of the spacing here. The spacing will basically determine the kind of level of resolution of that resulting poly surface and also the size of that poly surface as well. The lower the number, the more dense that kind of surface will be and the more detailed it will be. So as an example, let's put the spacing on 10 to start with. I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to draw my rectangle out like so. Just select that. And then you can see in the right hand window here, we've then got that surface there. And it's quite a simple form. If I put this on a rendered view, we can see that we've kind of lost some of the detail that's in that original model. It's still got all the kind of terrain and the major sort of peaks and mountains we're looking at, but it hasn't got all the nuance of that detail that's there. So potentially spacing of 10 is probably kind of too simplified for what I want. So what I'm gonna do then, Let's keep that there just as a comparison, but we'll use the drape tool again. Let's put this back on a shaded just to speed it up. Drape. And I'm going to put the spacing now to a spacing of one here. Hit enter. And then we're just going to select that shape over the top like so. And you'll see here that it might take a while to load this up in the kind of 3D view as well. It's a lot more dense. You can already see the sort of like density of the spacing here it makes it almost a sort of black shape compared to the one on the right there so we've got a lot more density in the model but that will mean we also get a lot more detail in the resulting geometry so depending on your computer just let this load out i wouldn't kind of rush it or restart it it will get there eventually it just can take a little bit of time depending on the kind of speed of your computer and the complexity of your terrain Once that's done, you can then see it here. We've then got this really dense version of that terrain. And I'm just gonna move it out so we can see it a bit more clearly. And there you can see we've got a very dense surface geometry now of our terrain. And if we look at it actually in the rendered mode, you'll see that there's really not much difference in the quality between the surface and the mesh there. So it's really kind of capturing all of that detail in our mesh, but turning it into a surface and in quite a quick way as well. Now. When you use the drape, you'll get this weird lip that occurs on the geometry. And usually I like to tidy this up before I start to use it. It's also hollow at the bottom, and I kind of want to make this into a 3D piece of terrain. So in order to do this, I'm just going to move that mesh back in place. And we're just going to trim off the edges just by drawing a rectangle slightly inbound of our mesh edge. So I've got the edge here. I'm going to draw it slightly inwards. And then I'm going to do it on this side as well. Then I'm going to just select that rectangle, type in trim, and then we're just going to trim the edge off as well. Um, and that will trim it there. And again, because it's quite heavy, it might take a little bit of time to update in the 3D, but we're just going to let that update there before we move on. Once that's done, we can exit the trim tool like so. And then I'm just going to select my surface and we're going to move it out here so we can see it like so. We'll just make that a bit bigger. And there we have, if we just go back to that shaded view, we've now got a single skin for the surface of our model, which we can then use to start to make into a 3D shape. Now, what I'll do now is I'll usually just take that surface. I'm going to use the extrude surface tool to extrude that into a 3D model, making sure that the solid option is ticked to yes. The way I do this is just extrude it right down, make it really large, doesn't matter how big it is, you want it quite large at this stage um, to extrude down, and then we're going to tidy it up using the Boolean difference tool to tidy it into a nice kind of block of geometry. So once you've got that, we can actually delete that top surface from the top, and then I'm just going to take my rectangle, 
um, box tool sorry here draw a large box below move it downwards to give us a little bit of thickness and depth to that piece and then we're just going to use the boolean difference command selecting our terrain first hitting enter selecting our box second and then subtracting one from the other and there you have a nice kind of closed polysurface piece of geometry which shows our terrain in detail so that was just a quick tutorial in how you take those contour lines from digimaps turn them both into a mesh into a surface and then into a 3d polysurface here that we can then work with now the beauty of this because it's a 3d model we can start using boolean tools to actually kind of excavate and create shapes within this as an example i'm going to take a sphere let's just draw a big sphere here and put it into there and let's say we wanted to carve a big bowl out of this mountainside for example we can input that shape in there and then i can use the boolean difference tools again select my kind of geometry hit enter select my sphere hit enter again and we can actually subtract that shape directly from our terrain and you can see the resulting form there so this gives us a lot of power to actually start to model directly into these really detailed terrain sites um, we can add pieces to it, we can work into it, um, and it gives us a lot of options that otherwise wouldn't be available if it was just a series of lines or a mesh. Now, as a final point, I just wanted to go through how you might start to turn this into a drawing. You'll find if you start to use the Make 2D on this, it actually might not capture the nuance of those kind of hillsides and cliffs that are in here. So let's say we've got a kind of lower view here, and we're just going to do a Make 2D of this piece here to try and capture a 2D drawing of this model and hit OK. Now that Make 2D is completed, if we look at it in the top view, and we'll just move it up here, you can see we're getting a bit of that hillside but we can't really get much definition of what's happening here, where this sort of circle is being taken out of. We're losing a lot of detail that you otherwise might have in your 3D model. So to counter this we're actually going to go full circle and we're going to go back to our perspective model here. I'm going to take this and we're actually going to add contour lines back into it to help give us some definition when we turn it into a drawing. So the best way to do this is actually if you explode the model out like so and then I'm going to deselect these edges so we just have this top surface then we're going to type in contour and make sure you spell it right there you go contour pick the base point of the model from down here pick the point perpendicularly above so we're just going to pick a point directly above that like so and then it asks us for the distance between the contours now previously my contours were every five meters for this one i'm going to do them every 10 meters so you can just type that in here i mean this is the previous distance i used so i'm just going to hit enter and that will start to chop up this site back into contour lines and it will capture any kind of changes I've made as well. So we're kind of recontouring the model with any edits we've done to it as well. Now what you'll find is if you then select that and we're going to take a drawing from here again, similar view, and we're going to do a make 2D again. With these contour lines in place, it's going to give us a lot more definition and detail of that hillside that otherwise we wouldn't have if we didn't use the contour lines. Now the Make 2D is complete, we can kind of compare it to the previous one we did. And you can see with the addition of those contour lines, we're now getting so much more detail in that kind of mountainside. And when you draw this up, you might add a kind of dashed line to the contours. So it kind of gives that extra bit of definition that we can really understand the shape of this valley here, the kind of dip that's being created in there, and the kind of level of detail on these. So that's just a quick tip for how you might start to visualize and draw these terrains. Now you've got them as a 3D model. I hope you found this video to, to Tutorial useful where we kind of went through the steps of creating our highly detailed terrain from our contour lines here and then turning it back into a drawing and if you want to watch any other videos on 3d modeling and landscape design within Rhino then please check out the videos on the channel thanks for watching